Welcome to the second Diplomacy Light podcast. Our discussion today with Dr. James Acton is about a core concept in international relations, one that forced itself to be properly absorbed by anyone thinking seriously about nuclear policy during the Cold War, but also one that is as often used with clarity as it is with dangerous ambiguity. Strategic stability. What is strategic stability exactly? How has it evolved as a concept and what does it mean today? James, one of the world's foremost authorities on nuclear policy, is as qualified to talk with as one can be on this topic. He holds the Jessica T. Matthews Chair and is co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, with a PhD in theoretical physics from Cambridge and a current research focus on the escalation risks of advanced conventional weapons and the future of arms control. His work on escalation includes entanglement, Chinese and Russian perspectives on non-nuclear weapons and nuclear risks, and the international security article Escalation Through Entanglement, with numerous publications that span the field of nuclear policy. James is a member of the Nuclear Security Working Group and the International Advisory Council for the Luxembourg Forum on Preventing Nuclear Catastrophe. He has published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Science and Global Security, and Survival. Diplomacy Live Podcast. Well, James, um, thank you very much for uh, coming to this podcast, uh, Diplomacy Light. Uh, there is indeed uh, quite a need of, for diplomacy uh, since it obviously failed uh, just uh, a few weeks ago uh, with disastrous consequences. And one of the things that um, I think is very important in general times uh, for people to understand uh, but it's not something that most do. Uh, I think that even in international relations, uh, the theme of our talk, strategic stability, um, people understand it differently. Uh, can you help us with this con uh, concept? Can you tell us what strategic stability is and, and, and briefly kind of take us through the development of this concept? Are there different meanings? And at the end, is it a good thing? Sure. Um, well, very happy to be here. And uh, as you say, strategic stability has different meanings. People use it in different ways. Um, I've sometimes compared the concept before to diplomatic spackling paste. You know, if you're a, if you're a diplomat, you're at a um, uh, an international conference on nuclear issues. You don't like what the other side is doing, but it's kind of hard to explain why building defenses is bad. Uh, you know, you accuse your other side of undermining strategic stability. And <coughs> I think the vagueness of this term and the fact that it's used differently by different people um, has really robbed it of utility. And in fact, I have stopped using that word myself in my own work. But I think there's a really important underlying concept there that it's critical to preserve. And I think the history of how this concept came about is worth understanding. You know, in the 1950s, when the US and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons and strategists were starting to grapple with uh, problems of nuclear strategy, one of the things that occurred to people was how vulnerable nuclear forces were to nuclear attack. Um, And, you know, in, in the US, this is first written about by, at length by people like Albert Wolfstetter. Um, now, look, this was a big concern for the military at the time because, you know, the US military didn't want its nuclear forces to be nuked by the Soviet Union because then the US wouldn't have any nuclear forces. Uh, and so, the, you know, the military viewed this as kind of a, a, a weakening of the US deterrent. There were then some civilian strategists who pointed out how this vulnerability could lead to a form of inadvertent escalation. And specifically what, you know, this, this for concept is most associated with Tom Schelling. Um, though, you know, others had kind of uh, edged towards the concept previously. But Schelling's point is this, you know, if the United States thinks wrongly that the Soviet Union is about to attack US nuclear forces, that could give the US an incentive to preempt, an incentive to use its nuclear forces first. And from the Soviet perspective, the fact that the US might use its nuclear forces first was a reason for the Soviet Union to use its nuclear forces first. So even if neither state wanted a nuclear war, 
Even if both states believed their interests were being best served by whatever crisis or conflict was going on remaining conventional. The fear that the other side might attack first was a pathway to nuclear war. And the concept of strategic stability in its original form was very much focused on that one specific escalation pathway. Um, Times of crises. uh, uh, In crises or in conventional conflicts, escalation because of fear that the other side would strike first. Now, one of the criticisms of this concept that's been levied throughout the years, including of recent years, was, yeah, but there's lots of other reasons why a nuclear war might start. And that's true. Like, Schelling and people like me that think this kind of escalation pathway is a problem are not saying this is the only pathway to nuclear war. You know, deliberate nuclear aggression uh, by a state that knows it's nu- is on the other side isn't going to use nuclear weapons, but believes its, its interests are best served by nuclear weapons is another pathway to war. So... But, you know, this idea about escalation through the, uh, you know, through the fear of surprise attack became known or rather the if the conditions existed to prevent escalation through the severe of through the fear of surprise attack, that became known as street as strategic stability. And then often the concept of arms racing was kind of tied into that as well because arms racing can be driven you know you might build up your nuclear weapons because you fear that they are vulnerable to the other side's nuclear weapons and so kind of arm that that motivation for arms racing got wrapped up into the concept of strategic stability as well yeah so you you you, the fear of being preempted uh creates incentives as Schelling uh, said it to preempt oneself, to attack oneself uh, ahead of time. And you, you, you make a very good distinction here in terms of, of, of different timescales, where um, a timescale that is within a crisis is quite different than a timescale that is uh, in terms of development of one's own uh, weapon systems. It's not just nuclear here, uh, weapons. Uh, it's not just the warheads, in other words. It's missiles, it's uh, early warning systems. It's all of these things have an effect. Uh, is, is that not the case? And, and again, yeah, if you could go into this timescale uh, difference, uh, that is not just looking at a, a given crisis situation, but really over a period of time of a few, few years. Yeah, so, 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 so that's exactly right. At the core of the traditional concept of strategic stability is this um, fear of being preempted. And in a crisis or a conflict, that could, in the worst case, lead to nuclear use which is a decision that could be taken in seconds or minutes. Um, It could lead a state to disperse its nuclear forces to make them more survivable. You know, many nuclear weapons are mobile, things like road mobile ICBMs, submarines, bombers. Uh, You might disperse those to make them more survivable. That's something that requires hours or days. Um, Over much longer time scales, if you're worried that your nuclear forces are vulnerable, you might build up nuclear forces. And that's something that could happen over uh, years, most likely. And as you point out, there's a bunch of other technologies that are tied into this, especially today. So, for example, you know, the reason why both Russia and China are concerned about U.S. ballistic missile defenses is because they are concerned that if the United States attacked their nuclear forces in a crisis and they only had a few missiles remaining, those missiles could be mopped up by U.S. ballistic missile defenses. And so ballistic missile defenses factor into strategic stability in that way. Uh, high, precision conven- excuse me, high precision conventional weapons that could threaten nuclear forces factor into strategic stability. Early warning systems, as you mentioned, factor into st- strategic stability. Because one way of protecting your nuclear forces is if you can detect an incoming attack on those forces before those forces are destroyed so you can launch them, um, that is a way of enhancing their survivability. And, you know, early warning systems are what you need to detect an incoming attack on your nuclear forces. So I think the original concept of strategic stability solely defined in terms of nuclear forces against nuclear forces, that for me is too narrow. I think you want to extend that to all of the other forms of weapons and technology that can directly interact with nuclear forces. 
So, like, I don't think that, you know, cyber hacking and election interference, as much as I'm outraged by that, is a strategic stability issue. I think cyber interference with nuclear command and control is a strategic stability issue. So I would still try to define strategic stability fairly narrowly in terms of these technologies that can directly interact with nuclear weapons. And as I say earlier, and this is absolutely critical, recognizing it is not the only cause of arms racing or escalation risk, but that it's not helpful to put to lump every cause under the same name, because then you essentially make strategic stability the same as international relations, and it becomes just an unmanageably large concept. We're better off keeping it as a narrow concept and understanding that it's not the only factor that's relevant to the planning of nuclear forces, nuclear posture, arms control, everything else that goes along with that. In this regard, there is a lot of presumptions on how the other side would, would react. Um, is it important, is it necessary for adversaries, um, nuclear adversaries, to share their understanding of what strategic stability means in order for it to be effective? And even today, do the main nuclear powers have the same early warning capabilities? And if not, is this a factor? If you ask major nuclear powers to define strategic stability, you will get very different answers from them. In fact, if you ask successive US administrations to define strategic stability, you will get different answers from them. You know, the Obama... <coughs> Excuse me. If you look at the Obama administration's nuclear posture review, it, it used the term strategic stability frequently without ever defining it. But it's very consistent with the view of strategic stability that I just presented. The Trump administration used the term strategic stability a few times, and it's really a synonym for effective deterrence. It's not about preventing inadvertent escalation or arms racing. The Trump administration is using it, was using it as a synonym for effective deterrence. The Russians tend to have a broader meaning of strategic stability still. Um, they, um, you know, they will often talk in terms of, um, you know, preventing all forms of armed conflict between nuclear armed adversaries. You know, China, on the one hand, denies that strategic stability is relevant to it because it's not in a Cold War context. On the other hand, you know, Chinese scholars often talk about strategic stability in an incredibly broad way, basically equating it to peaceful relations between states. So, there is no question that um, the US and Russia and China and lots of analysts and, you know, I don't think many countries take positions on strategic stability apart from those three, but, you know, many analysts do. There is an enormous range of different definitions of strategic stability. And yet, at some level, I don't think that matters. At the end of the day, even if China and the US don't share the same definition of strategic stability. If each side is convinced that the other side has survivable second strike capabilities, if each side believes that it can't um, preemptively destroy the other side's nuclear capabilities, neither of them becomes likely to initiate um, a disarming first strike on the other. They may still have incentives to engage in limited nuclear use, and that could escalate. But if both sides are confident in the survivability of both their own nuclear forces and the other side's nuclear forces, then they will, then you will have helped block off one pathway to nuclear war. Whether or not they say they share the same definition of strategic stability, and indeed, if you listen to the things that Chinese ex uh, officials complain about, they complain about ballistic missile defense, they complain about conventional prompt global strike. You know, they may not equate that with strategic stability, but they are thinking according to that basic concept that I was outlining earlier about the value of survivable second strike capabilities, even if they're not calling it by that name. So in an attempt to perhaps standardize the, the usage, uh, you provide a very um, uh, alluring definition. I'll, I'll read it out right now. Uh, a deterrence relationship is stable if neither party has or perceives an incentive 
to change its force posture out of concern that an adversary might use nuclear weapons first in a crisis. So force posture is, is, is a key element here. Can you uh, tell us more about it, both in terms of as, as, a, as a posture that is defined uh, over the long term, in the strategic terms, and as well in, in a given conflict, as we have right now, uh, a, a posture of saying, don't uh, come in here, or otherwise uh, you will see something that you've never seen. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this concept of the force posture that, that, that you mentioned in the definition? Sure. So firstly, um, you know, let me, I'm, 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 I'm very impressed you dug up that article. Um, I wrote that about 10 years ago now. And I read and the whole book. It's an excellent one. I would, I, would re, I would define, today I would define strategic stability slightly differently than I did back then. You know, one thing that that definition doesn't mention is changes in force posture because you're worried that your nuclear forces are about to be attacked by conventional forces. Like that is something that if I were if I were rewriting that chapter today, I wouldn't have exactly the same definition. But I uh, 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 because I think um, I didn't, as I said, I didn't adequately take things like fear of a conventional first strike into account. But you know, I still think the the basic themes in that chapter are the right one. But in answer to your specific question, you know, when I say things about changing your force posture, for me, a change of force posture can be anything from um, buying more nuclear weapons and delivery systems, developing new systems, um, changing where your systems are based and located, um, dispersing mobile forces in a crisis, uh, alerting nuclear forces for use or even using nuclear weapons. You know, it is really anything at all that changes an aspect of your nuclear forces. And so what I'm saying in that definition is if you're changing your force posture in any of those ways, because you're worried that, that your forces lack survivability, uh, I would today I would say from a nuclear or a conventional attack, then for me that is a manifestation of strategic instability. And if that happens on timescales of months or years or decades, uh, you know, buying more, expanding your nuclear arsenal because you're worried about survivability, that's what we normally call arms racing. Um, if you're using nuclear weapons because you're worried your adversary is about to destroy your nuclear forces preemptively, you know, that's, off, that's sometimes what we call crisis instability. And the time when this concept has been thought of uh, at, the, at the outset and then uh, continuously uh, updated and, and what you've just uh, demonstrated uh, updating your own definition really talks about a fluid uh, aspect and I think that for for many people it's a very um, static aspect and it's not is it and and to go even further uh, it does matter what the nature of the international system is. This was a time of a bipolar uh, system. Uh, perhaps we had a unipolar moment. We're back into kind of multipolar uh, thinking right now. How does the strategic stability change uh, depending on the international system? Does the international system influence it? So I think it, it, I think it does. Um, again, sticking with the kind of ideas of st strategic stability that I... Um, I laid out and you know I, I pref I say that as a preface because um, the nature of the international system you know whether it's bipolar or multipolar or whatever has many other implications for nuclear weapons other than strategic stability but focusing on strategic stability I think the thing that worries me most here is kind of the arms racing side of strategic stability um, which is that if one country has two nuclear adversaries, um, it becomes harder to prevent arms racing with both of them simultaneously. It, to, be, to, to give you a very practical example of that, um, you know, right now the US and Russia are engaged in a, um, you know, have a new start in place. They have a strategic, a strategic arms control treaty. Um, that regulates their strategic nuclear forces. Um, and I should say, when we use the term strategic nuclear forces, that language of strategic nuclear forces, I think it's, again, it's a very unhelpful term. It comes from the Cold War. 
but it means US and Russian nuclear forces that can reach one another's homelands without being forward deployed. So, you know, it refers to ICBMs, very long range bombers and submarines, basically. Everything else is non-strategic. And, you know, at the moment, US and Russian nuclear forces are limited by New START. Um, and um, the US is increasingly concerned that about China's buildup of its nuclear forces. You know, Russia may or may not be more quietly concerned about this. But because China's building up its nuclear forces, the US may not be satisfied with having the same number of nuclear weapons as Russia. It may want a bigger nuclear arsenal than Russia so it can compete with China. But Russia is never going to agree to an arms control treaty that has unequal limits for the US and Russia. And so, you know, I think there is a danger that because of China's build up, the US will try to build up to complete to compete with China and not do more arms control with Russia. And that in turn will lead Russia to build up to compete with the US. So <coughs> in those kind of ways where you have three countries and in the case of the US, it's trying to deter both adversaries, Russia and China. You can easily, I think, see how uh, when New START expires, we could get into a trilateral arms race there. Um, you know, there are other ways as well. Uh, you know, for example, um, India, sorry, uh, you know, Pakistan is building up its nuclear forces. Um, in large part because it's worried about Indian conventional forces apart from anything else. And, you know, India appears to be kind of progressing at a steady rate, but sooner or later it might feel it has to respond to Pakistan and build up its nuclear forces more quickly. But if India builds up its nuclear forces, that in turn puts more pressure on China to build up its nuclear forces more quickly, which in turn has implications for the US and Russia. So in a world... Not, not to mention the Middle East. Right. So, you know, in a, in a world in which you have multiple nuclear armed states that aren't just isolated dyads, then arms racing dynamics can become a lot more difficult to manage. I worry a little bit less about crises with multiple nuclear armed states. You know, I tend to think that if the US is in a nuclear crisis, it will be a US-Russian nuclear crisis, or it will be a US-Chinese nuclear crisis, or it will be a US-North Korea nuclear crisis, or there may be an Indian-Pakistani nuclear crisis, or conceivably a Sino-Indian nuclear crisis. And that actually, like, in the crisis itself, the crisis will be very bipolar in character. There are people that disagree with that. Like, I think there are people now in the US and... Um, you know, who are now writing publicly about the possibility of a Sino-Russian military alliance and the idea that the US might have to fight a two-front war against China and Russia simultaneously. You know, I think that's unlikely, but maybe I will turn out to be wrong. Uh, but in that case, again, if, if, that's, if I am wrong, you know, if you can imagine situations in which China and Russia are doing joint nuclear planning against the US, um, then 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 in a crisis you would be potentially having kind of this uh, 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 not really a bipolar character to that crisis anymore so i think i think i think the nature of the international system does have important implications for strategic stability um, but it's also very hard to predict how that system is going to evolve over time and so precisely what those implications are going to be And what of arms control regimes? You mentioned uh, that uh, New START was extended, luckily, uh, just uh, a few months ago into 2026. Uh, but the ABM treaty is, is dead. Well, these are bilateral, but still uh, have provided a lot of... Uh, well, have they provided uh, stability uh, in this regard? The ABM, uh, the INF, the uh, Open Skies... Um, NPT right now is a, it, there's a review conference that has been uh, postponed several times. We're, we we don't know what direction that is going to go. Do arms control disarmament regimes um, have have they had a role, and what is their possibility uh, in the in the near future? And I understand it's quite fluid, but what would be your best uh, case scenario, realistically? So you know, going back to this idea that I've kind of come back to a few times, that strategic stability is important, but it's not the only consideration by any means. 
I think there are lots of arms control regimes that are very valuable, but are not primarily geared towards enhancing strategic stability in the way that I have said it. Like, you know, I think the MPT is a fantastic treaty and it's under a lot of stress at the moment and I strongly support it. I just, it, it, it's not really to do with strategic stability. Um, you know, even things like the late lamented Open Skies Treaty, I think are primarily not, they may be very, very marginally help on this by increasing transparency a bit, but they're not primarily about strategic stability in the way that I've defined it. The two treaties that are really, really about strategic stability are, or former treaties were the ABM Treaty that limited missile defences and the series of US, Soviet and then US, Russia bilateral treaties that limited strategic offensive arms. So SALT 1 in 1972, SALT 2 from 1979, which never actually entered into force, but the sides respected it anyway for a while. START 1, START 2, which never entered into force, and now New START. Um, and I, I should probably add the Moscow Treaty as well to that list, 2002, I think. Um, those are the treaties that really did focus on strategic stability. Um, in the case of the offensive uh, um, treaties like New Start, you know, they directly prevent arms racing. Um, you know, they are they 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 limit um, you know by limiting U.S. and Russian strategic forces, they prevent arms racing. By providing transparency into those forces, they allow each side to be confident in the number the other side has, and hence know that the other side can't preemptively destroy their nuclear forces. And that is, it bolsters strategic stability. I mean, I think if you imagine a world without New START and, or without a strategic arms control treaty, and unfortunately we may be moving towards such a world, you know, I think it's a world in which there are much greater fears of the other side building, it, building up its forces, and that creates pressures to respond in kind. The ABM treaty handled the defensive side of that. So as I've mentioned already, you know, one of Russia's and China's concerns about ballistic missile defenses and kind of irony of irony, you're now starting to hear Americans complain about Russian and Chinese ballistic missile defenses. Um, but, you know, as I said, they worry that Russia and China worry that if the U.S. attacked their nuclear forces preemptively, then the few rem missiles that remained would be mopped up by U.S. missile defenses. And so the ABM Treaty contributed to strategic stability uh, by limiting missile defences. Well, the Bush administration withdrew from the ABM Treaty. Um, in, uh, it, it announced the withdrawal in late 2001. The withdrawal became operative <coughs> in 2002. Um, and, you know, frankly, with the benefit of... I mean, some, lots of people said this at the time, but with the benefit of 20 years hindsight, I think it was a terrible decision. You know, the U.S. has ended up with a missile defense system against North Korea that has a deeply unimpressive real world testing record. And it has an, and I believe there are large parts of Russia's and China's strategic modernization program that are directly attributable to fears about ballistic missile defenses. And I say China there because although China wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, although China wasn't a party to the ABM treaty, it benefited from knowing that. U.S. and Russian ballistic missile defenses were limited. Um, at, at, at this point, then, how is the U.S. Uh, <coughs> looking at the A2AD and anti-Axis area denial uh, over the North Pole by Russia, over Kaliningrad, over now the Crimea? And reversely, um, the Russians have voiced concerns over uh, Devesil and Rejikovo, uh, saying uh, they, we don't see this as against Iran, we're seeing this as something else. What, what, uh, how has this? Uh, it, and it is, as you as you say, most probably a direct result of the ABM uh, withdrawal. Uh, so, what is the the status right now? How, what, what, how do you view it? Um, the. I think the first thing. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, sorry. I think the first thing to say about missile defences is it's helpful to unbundle them um, in, 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 into different um, um, types of missile defences. The ABM Treaty didn't try to limit all missile defences. 
it specifically tried to limit uh, homeland missile defenses capable of intercepting incoming intercontinental ballistic missiles and um, <coughs> um, sea launch ballistic missiles. A lot of like the A2AD capabilities, they're just not of that kind of missile defenses. Um, you know, the US is concerned about Russian and Chinese uh, missile defenses as part of these A2AD bubbles. The US has similar kinds of systems. None of these would have been limited by the, by, by the ABM treaty. Um, the US Aegis Ashore system, the Russians are concerned that those interceptors could intercept Russian ICBMs. I don't think those fears are, are, are correct, but I think they're kind of genuine fears. <coughs> I'm sorry, on the part of Russia. Um, I would, you know, off the top of my head, I've never actually thought through the question about whether the Aegis Ashore systems would have been prescribed under the ABM treaty. Um, my initial instinct is to say the US would argue they wouldn't and Russia would argue that they would have been. But like, I'd have to go, I have to go back to the treaty and take a very careful look at the language there. The, the uh, SM3 block uh, 2A is basically, I think, traveling at a speed of, uh, what is it, 4.5, 5 uh, kilometers per second. That's, that's quite uh, capable of probably uh, even hitting uh, an ICBM at, at launch, no? Um. Well, so f firstly, the ABM treaty didn't specify speeds in the treaty itself. There was a subsequent US-Russia <coughs> negotiation over speeds, but that was actually kind of never, the two sides never um, ratified the documents that resulted from that. Um, it's not just speed that's important, it's also location. It's much harder to intercept ICBMs if your interceptors are placed near them as they are in Poland and Romania. So, you know, it is the, the SM32A has been used to intercept an incoming ICBM um, near, near uh, re-entry. Uh, that was a test that took place last year or the year before. Uh, whereas the Polish and Romanian sites are close to... Uh, 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 are close to Russia and they're not well located, I would argue, to intercept US and Russian, ICBM, uh, Russian ICBMs. But like, there is a bigger point here. One can, you know, there is a historical point about would the ABM treaty have precluded these uh, interceptors. Then there's a contemporary point about what to do about Russian concerns. You know, my view is that we should take Russian concerns about Aegis Ashore seriously. I don't think they are, I don't think Russian concerns are correct. I do not think the Aegis Ashore interceptors in Poland and Romania could catch Russian ICBMs. But I don't think that Russia is lying about these concerns. I think Russia is genuinely concerned about them. And I think there is great value to a kind of confidence building process focused on these Aegis Ashore systems. Um, so, you know, the two things that I have proposed, um, one is an extension of an Obama era proposal, but basically to allow Russia to use its own equipment to measure the speed of US interceptors in tests so that Russia understands the speed and we can, um, which, which I believe ought to help mitigate Russian fears. And then secondly, Russia has also expressed a quite separate concern about Aegis Ashore which is that the launchers may be loaded with cruise missiles uh, that, could, that, could, that could attack Russia. And again, I, colleagues and I have proposed an inspection regime um, so that Russia could verify that these launchers are not launched with cruise missiles. Now, there would have to be reciprocity with all of this, right? You know, and, 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 and there's a good question about what that reciprocity should look like. But, you know, the big point that I want to focus on here is that um, you know one could argue had the ABM treaty remained in force exactly which missile defenses it would have covered but the bigger issues I think are we're in a bad place with homeland missile defenses those that were unambiguously covered by the ABM treaty and we ought to be taking Russian concerns about shorter range defenses uh, uh, seriously uh, as part of a reciprocal confidence building process. You, you speak of, and as we uh, near the, the, the time we have, um, you, you've, you've written as well uh, about entanglement. And, and if, I, if I could ask you to perhaps 
uh, speak a little bit on that because uh, in, in, in saying, for instance, right now that uh, the Aegis Ashore may have cruise missiles, it, it is the precision of the cruise missiles, right, of conventional weapons that are becoming much, much more precise um, and uh, with, a, with extreme uh, power themselves, not to, to be short of, of nuclear. Can you uh, untangle entanglement uh, for us? So I use the term entanglement to describe the interactions between the nuclear and non-nuclear domains. You know, as we were discussing earlier during the Cold War, the primary threat to nuclear forces came from other nuclear forces. Um, Today, there is a much wider range of technologies that can plausibly threaten nuclear forces. And particularly, I worry a lot about non-nuclear threats to nuclear command and control systems. Many of those command and control systems are dual use. They support nuclear and conventional operations. That is another manifestation of entanglement. Uh, dual use weapons, weapons that can hold nuclear or non or non nuclear warheads. That's another form of entanglement. And all of this, I think, can lead to various escalation risks. So, just to give you one kind of very concrete example here um, US early warning satellites, which during the Cold War, you know, the predecessors of the current system, were designed to detect the launch of Soviet nuclear-armed ballistic missiles heading towards the US. Now these systems are much more capable and they can detect non-nuclear munitions too, like short-range non-nuclear ballistic missiles. So in a fight between NATO and Russia in Europe, and it's not hard to imagine such a fight right now, you know, imagine that Europe's uh, regional missile defenses, not the, you know, not the homeland stuff, but the regional missile defenses, Uh, were proving effective in shooting down Russian non-nuclear missiles. Russia might try to weaken those defenses, conceivably by attacking US early warning satellites, since those early warning satellites detect those non-nuclear missiles and cue NATO's defenses. But from a US perspective, Russia hasn't just attacked assets involved in the conventional war in Europe, Russia has attacked part of the United States nuclear command and control system. Now, under current U.S. nuclear doctrine set out in the Trump administration, the U.S. reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in that scenario if there are non-nuclear attacks against U.S. nuclear command and control assets. Now, I, I don't think we would immediately use nuclear weapons if Russia attacked the U.S. nuclear command and control system, but I do think it would be an enormously escalatory action that would move us further along the path to nuclear war. Uh, one quick question before before we end. Um, what would be the consequences, the impact on strategic stability if a tactical nuclear weapon were to be used? Um, do you think that... And, you know, the Middle East comes immediately to mind. Would, would you think that there would be a complete change of obviously of how they are used? Uh, and, and will that have an impact on strategic stability? And since we're near the end, then I, I don't want to finish on that. I really want to then hear your, your, your ways out uh, to, to, a, a stri- to, to a stable um, equilibrium uh, in the inter- international system in the near term. Look, there are no tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, I, this language of strategic versus non-strategic is so problematic because it obscures the fact that any use of a nuclear weapon would be strategic. And any use of a nuclear weapon risks escalating up to something absolutely apocalyptic. In terms of a way out, what I would say is this. I think there are unilateral and cooperative measures that states can and should take. I think unilaterally there are important changes to the way that states plan and posture their nuclear forces uh, and their conventional forces that is something that can be done in the short term to reduce escalation risks. And I think cooperatively there is a whole bunch of stuff that could be done, you know, ranging from the kind of confidence building measures with Aegis Ashore transparency that we were talking about through to much more ambitious measures. I mean, you know, for example, I think prohibiting space-based missile defences. would be a good way to bolster strategic stability. Um, I, um, um, so, you know, I think there is a lot to be done. I think the politics of this is really difficult right now. 
James, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your uh, knowledge on this uh, very important issue. Uh, and thank you very much for being a guest on the Diplomacy Light uh, podcast. Hope to see you soon. You're always invited. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's good to be here.